All right, everyone, please put on your headphones. We're about to get started. Can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. All right. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm Robert, and we're going to talk about GraphQL. Let me introduce myself briefly. I work on the developer relations team here at AWS. I've been here for the past year and a half. Prior to joining AWS, I was a software engineer on the GraphQL team at Facebook. And just this last year, I helped AWS join the GraphQL Foundation as a founding member. Prior to Facebook, I was a software engineer at Microsoft, where I worked on the .NET framework, Windows Server, Xbox Game Studios, and the Startup Business Group. I also want to share a personal achievement of mine. This last year, I published my first book. <laughs> this book has not sold any copies, so it is accurate. The title is accurate. Here are a few breakout sessions and workshops that you might find useful if you like the content that you see here. I think most of them are full, so you might want to try a walk-up or catch one of the recorded sessions afterward. All right, GraphQL. Rather than talking about it, I'm going to show you what it is. I've built this demo for GraphQL. And we're going to learn GraphQL by way of an exercise. The exercise is to fetch the names of all of the Star Wars characters that appeared in films with Luke Skywalker. And to help us fulfill this requirement, we have two APIs. One of these APIs is built out using the REST architectural style. And the other API has the exact same data built out as a GraphQL endpoint. I'm going to start with REST, because I think that's what we're most familiar with. So if I click this REST API, I'm taken directly to the Luke Skywalker resource. I know that the screen is probably hard to read for the address bar. But what you see here is an IP address where this server is running slash API slash people slash one. This is the URI corresponding to the resource representation for Luke Skywalker. And what we see here, this is an extension that makes JSON a little bit easier to read in the browser. But we see a JSON document with a number of fields. A lot of these are string fields, as we might expect. Name, height, mass, hair color, eye color, birth year, gender. And then later on down in the document, we see a couple of other fields that are populated by hypermedia links. Links to other documents, other resources. This field here, films, looks promising. It seems to represent the films that Luke Skywalker appeared in. So we have our first clue for how to solve our exercise. But before I open up one of these film links, does anybody know what the structure of a film is? Does anybody know what fields it's going to have or what types those fields are? How would I know? How would I find out? Click the link. It's a good suggestion. Let's click the link. <laughs> All right, so this is API slash film slash one. This is apparently New Hope. It has episode underscore ID with a numeric value. Maybe I would have expected episode ID, all one word, or snake cased. I don't know. How could I have guessed that it was underscore? Maybe by convention from the previous resource? Uh, it has the opening crawl, but um, it's called opening underscore crawl. And another thing about this opening crawl field, this is a lot of text, but it has nothing to do with the requirement. If I want to fetch the names of all the characters that appeared in movies with Luke Skywalker, I have no use for the opening crawl field. Yet when I click this hyperlink, here it is. But we don't have to scroll down much further to find the data that we're actually looking for. This is an array of hypermedia links for characters. And this seems to indicate that these are the characters that appeared in this film, the hypermedia links for each of these characters. Let's click through one more of these characters. This one is Darth Vader. 
and we have the name. So from that, because we're so familiar with navigating web pages, we kind of have a solution in front of us, don't we? We have a, a, an algorithm. We'll start with this people slash one resource representing Luke Skywalker. We'll fetch all of the films inside the films field. For each film, we'll fetch all of the characters. And then for each character, we'll parse out the name. And that is the exact code that I've written up here. This run rest function will execute when I click this fetch with rest button. Let's go over the code very quickly, make sure that it's doing what we think we're doing. We start off with this hard-coded URI representing Luke Skywalker. We're calling await fetch. This await keyword just says that we're awaiting the response of a network request. We fetch the resource at this URI. We store it in a local variable. We parse out its films. And then we use this helper function, fetch all. This is just going to issue HTTP requests in parallel, fetching all of the films. And then for each film that comes back, we take out the character field, and then we flatten that into one giant array of characters. We call unique to eliminate duplicates. And then we call fetch all again to fetch all of the character re resources. And then once that returns, we're just going to do some simple string manipulation and then stick it into a DOM element with ID names. And hopefully that will display on the, on the page if everything is working. OK? I'm going to open the network tab. And I want you to pay attention to what happens in the network tab when we click Fetch with REST. All right, so this is about 100 network requests. And you can see that we are using a maximum amount of parallelism here. Lots of network requests in flight, in parallel. OK? So that's what happens when you use the REST API. What about the GraphQL API? This is the exact same data. It's just being served through the GraphQL API. And what we're looking at here is GraphQL Playground. This is one of the GraphQL IDEs. And what we can do with this is author the GraphQL request in the left-hand side, send it to the server when we hit the Play button. And then the server will process the request and send back the response in JSON format, which we will display on the right-hand side. So how do we author a request against this GraphQL endpoint? To do that, we should inspect the schema that powers this GraphQL endpoint. And the schema is an authoritative description of all of the types, the nodes, the edges, and the scalar fields on each node. For example, here, you can see that the film has the following fields. And each field in yellow has a type. So it's telling you URL is a string. This exclamation means that this is a non-nullable string. You will never get the null, a null as the value for the URL when you fetch a film from this GraphQL API. The server is making that promise to you. Down here, we have the character's edge. And this edge is of type non-nullable array of non-nullable persons. Now, an empty array is not null. So this field can return the empty array if no characters appeared in this film. That is valid. The contents of this array are guaranteed to be non-null. So you'll never have a person, null, and then another person. But our query has to begin with an operation. And this is the only operation that this GraphQL API supports, the query operation, which means that we're performing a read against this API. So in order to begin our document, I just write query, followed by a pair of curly braces. And then I can specify any one of these fields inside the query type. These fields are special fields. They are called root fields. And they are the entry point into our graph of Star Wars data. The specific entry point we're going to use is this person root field. It takes as an input parameter something called name of non-nullable string. So this entry point appears to allow us to designate the specific character that we're going to use to navigate the remainder of the graph. 
Now, what follows is that this person field returns something of type person. But person is not a scalar field. It's a complex type with other fields and relations within it. And one of the rules of the GraphQL language is that your GraphQL document must terminate in scalar fields. You can think of scalar fields as primitive types, strings, ints, floats, id, enum, bool, right? Those are scalar fields that you can no longer select into anymore. There's nothing to select into when you're already at an integer. But when you're at a complex object like person, you can keep selecting. And wherever you can keep selecting, you must keep selecting. In other words, the query that we've written here so far is not a valid GraphQL document. We must specify at least one or more scalar fields under person. So what we can do is just fetch name out of person. And in, if we run this query and it returns the same name that we entered, then we have a high assurance that we are at the node that we expect to start in. OK? So when I run this, indeed, we are at the correct person. Looks good. So we know that person has a field called films of type non-nullable film. So if we say films, again, the scalar rule applies. What do I want to select out of a film? Let's just select the title for now and see if we're on the right track. Looks pretty promising, right? These appear to be the movies that feature Luke Skywalker. We already saw that the film object contains the characters field. Characters. And then from each character, I want the name. And now my response contains Luke Skywalker, an array of films, and in each film, the array of characters, and for each character, the name, in a single network round trip, containing the exact data that I need. And notice that the opening crawl is nowhere to be seen. Now all I need to do is copy and paste this query back in my source code. This function right down here, run GraphQL. This is what happens when we click fetch with GraphQL. And actually, I'm not going to paste it. Um, this is the exact same query that we wrote, except that we omitted the query operation keyword. We start with the GraphQL endpoint instead of a resource. And then notice that this is the only await keyword in this function, which means that this is the only network request. Now, after the response comes back, we still need to do a little bit of work. We need to flatten the characters array. We need to map it. We need to deduplicate it. We need to join it. And then we need to stick the result into the, um, the element at the bottom here, where we're displaying all the names. Right? But there's only one network request if we're reading the code correctly. Let's see if that's the case by paying close attention to the network tab when I run fetch with GraphQL. And indeed, we only see one network request. If we can trust the browser inspector here, we have the exact same response. We have a lot better latency because we're making only one network request. All right? That's GraphQL. I think that if you understand what we just did there, you understand 80% of GraphQL already. All right. Let's break it down. What did we see? Well, we wrote a GraphQL document, and that was carried along in the request that we sent to the server. The server processed the request and responded with JSON. And the structure of the JSON document closely resembled the request. It's as though GraphQL language is JSON, except you strip away the value parts of JSON, and then you remove the, the double quotes, leaving only the keys. And that's intentional. The, GraphQL, the structure of the GraphQL request is designed to give you a good sense of the shape of the data that's going to be returned. We also saw that there are a couple of rules regarding the GraphQL language, like curly braces must, whenever you have an opening, opening curly brace, you have to have a closing curly brace. There are some words that are not allowed. You can't have arbitrary spaces. 
those rules are defined in the GraphQL language specification. This is an open source document. Then we saw that this particular GraphQL endpoint had fields, root fields in the query like people, person, starships, films. And those are clearly domain specific. Not every GraphQL API will have those root fields. Those are special with respect to the Star Wars domain. And when you combine the schema with the GraphQL language specification, you can now know whether a GraphQL document is valid without ever issuing a request to the server. It's the exact same way if you had a database, a relational database, you have the schema in front of you, so you know what each table is, looks like. Before you ever run the SQL statement, you know whether or not that SQL statement is syntactically valid, right? Because there are domain agnostic rules about the SQL language itself, and then there are domain specific rules about the schema that powers that particular SQL instance. When you combine those two sets of rules, you get validation. That's exactly the way it works with GraphQL. And finally, we had a server running. This server was running on the virtual server that was sitting behind that IP address in the demo. And this server is just sitting there and listening for these incoming requests, processing them, and then sending back the response in JSON format. I also like to talk about the things that GraphQL is not. GraphQL uh, is not the most fortunate name. Most people, when they hear it for the first time, they think, ah, that's a graph database query language. It is not a graph database query language, but the asterisk means that I'm lying to you. <laughs> because we have databases like Neo4j, a very popular graph database, that have implemented a dialect of GraphQL called GraphQL plus minus that is able to be used as the native querying language for the graph database. So what I mean to say here is GraphQL was not designed as a graph database query language. It is sometimes used as a graph database query language, but that's not under our control. It's also not a solution for client-side state management. When you see the data coming back from the server and it looks like it's the exact thing that you want, you might be tempted to think, well, this is an opportunity to get rid of Relay and Redux. I don't need that anymore. But GraphQL doesn't even try to solve those problems and those libraries are useful in their own right. It's not a solution for binary streams. So if you're streaming large files, chunks of data, binary data, audio streams, video streams, not a good solution. Most of what GraphQL use, is used for is for these kinds of JSON APIs. Don't confuse it with the Facebook Graph API either. The Facebook Graph API is the Facebook third-party REST API for developing Facebook applications. GraphQL is not limited to any database on the back end, and it doesn't have to be used with any database at all. As we'll see later, the logic that backs every field in the GraphQL schema is an arbitrary function. It is not limited to the JavaScript ecosystem. In fact, GraphQL servers have been implemented in every popular language. And on the front end, it doesn't have to be used with React, Relay, or web applications. In fact, it was originally created to solve the data fetching needs for the Facebook native mobile applications. And finally, at the transport layer, it does not strictly need to be used with HTTP. In fact, HTTP is not even sufficient if you want to use the subscription operation. Speaking of operations, we saw one of them, the query. And the query models read. And this is, think of this as a nullipotent operation. Whether you run it or not, the server will be in the exact same state. And then we have the mutation, which models a write. And the mutation takes the server from one state to another. Now the query and the mutation both use a request response style of interaction between the client and the server. The client asks, sends the request over to the server, the server responds, and then that conversation is over. Queries and mutations are also only semantically meant to model reads and writes. There's nothing stopping you from building a query that goes and deletes a bunch of rows in the database, and there's nothing stopping you from writing a mutation that returns a bunch of constant data. These Operation types are identical and they exist, they're separated only to help you communicate with the developer, with the consumer of the API. In this way, it's very similar to the HTTP get and post verbs, where you can wire up your controllers to delete rows in response to an HTTP get operation, but the consumer of that get operation might be left scratching their head. And likewise, the post operation can have no effect on the server, right? So use these widely, wisely, they're there for, to help you communicate. 
The subscription operation is unique. It follows a request stream style of interaction. So the client sends the server a request saying, I want to subscribe to some stream of data. And the server responds with a long-lived connection that, it may, that keeps open with the client. And it pushes data along that persistent connection whenever, uh, according to the, the parameters of the subscription document. And in this way, you can build reactive, asynchronous, real-time applications like chat rooms, uh, navigation apps, health monitors, you know, sensors, lots of different ap applications here. Let's dissect this query structure. When you write a query, the first keyword here is the operation type, query, mutation, or subscription. It's followed by an optional operation name. This is an alphanumeric string. And this is useful because if you log this out when the request arrives on the server, you now have the operation name throughout your server logs, and that'll help you when you try to debug stuff. We didn't see this in the demo, but this is an example of an input variable. And an input variable makes your query more reusable. What we did see is that we hard-coded the input variable to Luke Skywalker. But if we write that down in a document, that document will only ever fetch Luke Skywalker. If we parameterize the name, then the document becomes more flexible and more useful. We're saying we want to fetch the following fields for any character. And what we see here between the two curly braces is called the selection set. This selection set also gives you a really good idea of what the return structure of the JSON document will look like. And here we have the root field. And then down here we have a subselection into the books field because books, if we left this out, books would not be terminating in scalar fields and this would not be a valid GraphQL query. Okay. So you might be curious, how do I build a GraphQL server? This looks pretty useful. How do I stand one up? What does the code look like? I'm going to show you one specific approach to building a GraphQL server, and then I'm going to talk about the libraries that we used. So this one is using uh, Node.js. Uh, and here I have uh, TypeScript as well. Um, and this is the server TS file, so this is the very top level entry point into this application. And what we have here is we're using a library called Apollo Server. Now Apollo Server is one of the most popular implementations of a GraphQL server. And here Apollo Server takes in one argument, it takes in a schema, which we get from calling this build app schema function that I'll show you shortly. And in fact, what I'm showing you here is that entire demo, that web page right here. This, and by the way, the repository for this code will be shared in the resources slide, which you will get if you scan your badge. But this whole demo, the web page, the, the client code, the REST API, the GraphQL endpoint, it's all in that repo. So that's why you see server starting several different things. Um, you see us starting the REST API here, and then you see us starting um, the GraphQL server, okay? So all of the magic is actually going to happen in this build app schema function. And this build app schema function here is very simple. It's assembling a bunch of different resolver classes. Now, resolver is a word you're going to hear in the GraphQL ecosystem a lot. But all it is is a function. A resolver is just a function, nothing more. So if we take a look at these resolvers, let's take a look at the person resolver. The person resolver is what populated the schema with the ability to fetch the list of people and a single person by name. So this is responsible for the people field that returned all of the people in my API. This function here is responsible for returning that single person, Luke Skywalker in the demo. And you can see that it's one line of code. It's indexing into people, but it is arbitrary code. It is just a function. That means anything I want to do here, I can do. I can return a hard-coded value. I can read it from a file. I can talk to the database. I can make a call out to another GraphQL server or another HTTP endpoint, whatever I want to do, right? Let's extend the schema in a very simple way, just so that you all see how this works. So I'm just going to copy this species resolver. 
And the name of the function here is going to be important because this is what will be emitted into the GraphQL schema. And then one more step, I have to include it inside my list of resolvers. And then I'm just going to start my server. Oops, something is using port 80. Let me make sure that, uh... okay, you know what we can do? We can follow the instructions here. If this doesn't work, we'll have to move on. But there's something else apparently taking up port 80 on this machine. OK, so I've started on port 8080 this time. And then now if I open up the schema, if I go down into query, we can see that we have created a new root field when we defined that resolver. And what this means is that we've applied everything we've learned so far. We can come in here and, whoops. And because query returns a string, it is a scalar field. So I have written a valid GraphQL request. And if I hit play, there you go. All right? we're now returning the, the string that we wrote in that function. Now, a couple of things I really want to point out. Do not think that this is the only way to build a GraphQL server. This happens to be TypeScript, but as I mentioned before, GraphQL servers are available in every popular language. So whatever language you want to use on the back end, you can use it. The second thing is that we're using a library called Type GraphQL, and Type GraphQL allows us to build a GraphQL in a style called code first. What that means is I am just writing these classes, and then it is generating the GraphQL schema by taking a look at these metaprogramming attributes, these decorators that I have, right? This is not the only way to write a GraphQL server. You can also write a GraphQL server by writing the schema first and then connecting the different resolvers when this, once the schema has been loaded. And both approaches are valid. They have various trade-offs. Um, it's a complex topic, but I can talk to you more offline after the talk if you're curious. Let's take it back to the slides. All right. Let's go over the history of GraphQL. In 2012, we built the first version of GraphQL internally at Facebook. And it was designed to, fetch the, to, to serve the data fetching needs of the Facebook native mobile applications. Now, those of you who used Facebook way back then, you might remember that the earliest versions of the Facebook mobile applications were just web views. They just pointed to Facebook.com. And Facebook.com served all of its data using a REST API. And so what we noticed when we benchmarked the mobile applications is that they had very bad performance, and they used a lot of network traffic, and, and they had all sorts of problems because they were just too chatty on the network. And mobile devices at the time were not nearly as powerful as they are today. Mobile networks are not nearly as good as they are today. So this problem was compounded in various ways. As a result, we built GraphQL. And the mobile applications, we switched over to native applications instead of using the web view. 
and we solved a lot of those problems. But there are lots of, uh, there were always lots of opportunities to improve that internal first version. And in 2015, we open sourced GraphQL in two parts. One, we decided to open source a specification so that anybody can implement the specification in any language that they chose. And two, we open, we open sourced GraphQL JS, which is the reference implementation. It is our attempt to implement the specification in a language that we thought would be very useful. And then from 2015 onward, we saw a lot of rapid growth and a lot of interest in GraphQL. A lot of companies started using it. But as we went along, these companies started to wonder, well, hold on a second. I don't like the licensing agreement for React. I don't like the licensing agreement for GraphQL. What if Facebook decides to change GraphQL in a way that I don't like? What if they decide to break backward compatibility? They can do that by versioning the spec in a way that nobody really had any input on, right? And uh, in 2018, we finally announced the solution to this problem, and it was the formation of the GraphQL Foundation. Now, the GraphQL Foundation is a neutral third-party organization designed to protect the evolution of GraphQL from any influence from any one particular vendor. And I'm very proud to announce that AWS is a founding member of the GraphQL Foundation. AWS, I believe this is one of the most important open source contributions that AWS has made in the last year. AWS is committing to supporting the GraphQL Foundation so that the language can evolve in a healthy way with the participation of the community. Now, you may also be wondering after seeing GraphQL so far, how does it compare to my favorite API technology? Or how does it compare to an API technology that perhaps that I don't like as much and I want GraphQL to solve the problems that I currently have? And there are a lot of these technologies. I mean, how many people here have used SOAP? Wow, that's a lot of people. That's more than I expected. Uh, so SOAP, you know, there are lots of shades of SOAP in GraphQL, right? Um, but we can't spend, we, we don't have enough time to compare GraphQL to all of these different API technologies. So I'm going to compare it to REST, and then hopefully by virtue of comparing it to REST, you understand how it compares to everything else. All right. Now, before we compare them, this is not a scorecard. There will be no winner at the end, so please don't think that there is, you know, if you see articles out there that are like, GraphQL is going to kill REST, that's just clickbait. Don't worry about it. Uh, OK, so show of hands, how many people here know what a REST API is? Please keep your hands up. Keep them high. All right, look around the room. Keep your hand up if you will agree with all of the other hands about what a REST API is. <laughs> the last person to give up was back there. I like, that's, that's OK, you, you hung in there. That's great. Um, OK, so what is REST? REST is representational state transfer. The, the most concrete definition we have of REST comes from Dr. Roy Fielding in his dissertation, his PhD dissertation in 2000. But 2000 was already four years after the web started taking off. What Dr. Roy Fielding did, and not to undersell his achievement at all, by the way, what he did was document the practices and the patterns that made the web so successful. Right? And when you do that, the end result is what he calls an architectural style. Not a specification, not a reference implementation. That's why we have all these really fun debates about what REST is. That brings us to our first point of comparison. REST has no shared definition. I'm just gonna go, go right out there and say that. It has no shared definition. But GraphQL is tied down. It's not up for debate. If I tell you I have a GraphQL endpoint, I'm telling you a lot. That means you can use any client to connect to it. You know exactly what constitutes a valid document. Given the schema, you never even have to issue a request before you can know ahead of time what the types are and whether it's valid. REST and GraphQL also have dramatically different conceptual models. At the heart of REST is the resource. And we can think of the resource as a virtual file that lives on the server, and that file has fields that link to other files. But in GraphQL, that resource concept doesn't exist. You cannot get a URI to an arbitrary node in GraphQL. You always have to enter the graph by using one of the root fields. So if you cling to the notion of a resource and you start using GraphQL, there are going to be some growing pains and perhaps some disappointments. But the graph model is very flexible. The data structure itself is very flexible. It's very powerful. It's one of the most 
useful data structures in all of computer science. And as a result, we're able to model all sorts of different things in GraphQL, and they're very intuitive. The organization model for REST APIs in Graph GraphQL is also very different. Uh, REST APIs are very good at, at federation. What I mean is that resources can link to other resources on other domains. So I can have a Wikipedia article with a hypermedia link that points to a New York Times article that contains a hypermedia link to a tweet. That's awesome. That's what makes the web so scalable. That's what makes the web so powerful. But you notice that the GraphQL API is powered by a schema. And the schema is the single central authority that says this is the consistent set of types and the relations to other types. If we tried to build a single GraphQL schema for the entire internet, imagine how difficult that would be. Imagine how many times, how often that, that schema would change. Imagine how many arguments there would be about how to model any one particular part of the schema, right? I'll go out on a limb and say that it's impossible to write one GraphQL schema for the entire internet. REST also has one of the, the REST architectural constraints is called the uniform interface constraint. It consists of four principles, one of which is called manipulation through resource representation. And what this means is that when you fetch a resource from a REST API, that resource contains hypermedia links to all the different ways that you can modify and delete that resource. If this existed in GraphQL, it would mean that every node had the ability to return the set of queries and mutations and subscriptions that modify and read that node. No such thing like this exists in GraphQL, and it's likely that no such thing like this will ever exist in GraphQL. So if you rely heavily on manipulation through resource representation, then you want to take a close look at how you're going to replace that functionality. GraphQL has something totally different, the introspection query. And the introspection query is a special query that allows you to download the entire schema. And the introspection query is what the tool GraphQL Playground used, that web app, that tool, before we issued our first request, it actually called out the, to the GraphQL server, it downloaded the schema, and it used it to generate the, the schema documentation on the fly. And that means the documentation will never be out of date. In REST, I've not seen any standard way to do this. Uh, I know that there are frameworks out there like Swagger that can generate documentation for you, but what if you're not using Swagger? There's no standard, this is certainly not part of the REST uh, uh, architectural constraints to support any sort of introspection query. For all of those who raised your hands uh, when I asked who has used SOAP, the introspection query is going to be very familiar to you. It's almost identical to the metadata exchange operation in SOAP where you download the WSDL document. In terms of data typing, we already saw this firsthand. When you're dealing with a REST API and you're dealing with structureless JSON, you have no way of knowing the names of the fields and the types of the fields before you issue a request. You don't know whether they're nullable either. In GraphQL, the data typing is strong because we have the schema that tells us exactly the, the, the type of every single field and whether it's nullable. And then real-time operations is a first-class citizen in the GraphQL world by way of the subscription operation. In REST, again, I'm sure people will debate me on this, but you just can't achieve real-time operations. Why? Because there's another constraint for REST called the statelessness constraint. And the statelessness constraint says that the server is not allowed to have any memory of conversations with a client. That makes it very difficult to keep a persistent connection open because you need to remember what you've pushed before. Okay? Now, before you think that these things, I, I, you know, the, this last one especially, you might think, well, this is just a straight up win for GraphQL, right? Not necessarily, because it turns out that the statelessness constraint exists in REST for a good reason, scalability. When you have a server that abides by the statelessness constraint, you have a very, very powerful recipe for scaling out your server, which is horizontal scaling. Stamp out copies, put them behind a load balancer, and then round robin route to any single one of them. Right? This is an extremely powerful way to scale. But when you get rid of the statelessness constraint and you now have persistent state, like open WebSocket connections between your gateway to a bunch of mobile clients or web, uh, web browsers, you cannot arbitrarily stamp out more copies of that server. You have to understand how that state will scale along with the application. So please take me seriously when I say that these are all trade-offs. And you cannot go on autopilot and choose one or the other based on you know, whichever, whichever one has more yeses. Uh, no matter what API technology you choose, you're in for a load of different challenges, right? You're going to be dealing with efficiency, cacheability, versioning, security, documentation, and on and on and on. Now, 
we don't have time to go through all of these, but I want to pick out three aspects of these API challenges that I think GraphQL does better than anything else. And I call these the three GraphQL superpowers. And then I also want to talk about the things that GraphQL doesn't do so well. So the first superpower is efficiency. And we saw this when we compared the number of network requests that GraphQL had to make versus the number of network requests that we had to make for the REST API. Efficiency actually breaks down into two problems. They're related. The first one is called overfetching. And in this case, the response from the server contains too much data. It contains the data that we wanted, but it also contains a bunch of other data, like that opening crawl text that we didn't end up using. In the case of underfetching, the response doesn't contain enough data. And as a result, the client needs to issue a follow-up network request. And this happens whenever you have a hypermedia link, because code can't do anything with a hypermedia link other than to issue another network request. And when you're using a REST API, if you are trying to implement the Hadios constraint, the hypermedia as the engine of application state constraint, this is consequently one of the most opinionated constraints for, for REST APIs. If you're trying to implement this, the closer you get to implementing something that Roy Fielding would approve of, the worse underfetching gets. And the reason why we're spending so much time talking about efficiency, overfetching, and underfetching is because network requests are the enemy. If you have ideal network conditions and you try to send a round trip ping between the US and Europe, that's 150 milliseconds of latency. And that's without, that's without transferring any data, without doing any computation. The, the ping gets there and it comes straight back. Speed of light. If you can avoid making that network request, well, you can read a meg of data, sequential data, random sequential data off of a modern SSD in just 400 microseconds. If you divide those two numbers, that's a difference of 400 times. That would be like ordering next day shipping on Amazon or next year shipping on Amazon. So you can do a lot for your application by being very careful about when to issue network requests. And the reason why this matters, you might wonder, well, okay, but I have a very powerful phone in my pocket. This is basically more powerful than any desktop computer we had 10 years ago. And I have LTE, I have 5G soon. Why do I still care about this? I guarantee you, you do. Because when you're at a conference like this, those LTE channels get pretty congested, right? Wi-Fi conference, cutting in and out all the time. And when you go to an airport, same problem, right? So even if you live in parts of the world where you have really good network infrastructure, you have a really powerful device in your pocket, you still benefit from efficient network, uh, network traffic in your applications. But think about the developing parts of the world. So much of the world is running on sub 2G networks. And those users are using devices that, are, that have decades old hardware in them. And even then, their data plans are capped. They pay by the megabyte, right? So I would say that this is a very serious responsibility if you're building applications to serve developing parts of the world, if your business is interested in expanding to those parts of the world. You really need to take this seriously. Another benefit of reducing the number of network requests is that you reduce the need for client-side joins, error handling, and retry logic. They don't completely go away, but to make this point clear, imagine in our REST exercise, if um, you know, a random two out of the 100 character HTTP requests timed out, what do we do? Right? GraphQL request is a single network round trip. It's not to say that it can't return errors. It's not to say that I can't fail. But wrangling with a single network request is just simpler. So you can get away with less bulk retry logic, error handling, et cetera. The second superpower of GraphQL is type safety. And we saw this when the schema tells us clearly what are all the fields names and their types and whether they're nullable. Ultimately, what you can do with scalability or <laughs> type safety is you can achieve higher predictability. You can generate statically typed bindings for your client code 
And this is especially beneficial if you're building Java applications for Android, if you're building iOS or Swift applications for iOS, if you're building a C-sharp application. Uh, anything on the client that is statically typed benefits tremendously from this. Because once you have those statically typed clients, your IDE can take over and it can tell you, hey, you missed a field. This is poorly typed. This is not going to work. And you'll never have a risk of deploying those bugs into production ever again. The third superpower, it has to do with domain modeling. And this comes from Eric Evans' book, Domain Driven Design, that he published in 2004. Can I please see a show of hands? How many people have heard of this book or re read this book? OK, that's quite a bit of people. Uh, if you haven't read this book, I recommend it. And I think there's a really, really interesting idea in this book. Uh, Eric basically has this idea that as you start to solve a problem, a business problem, with code, you start to learn how to solve it. And in that process, you develop something called the ubiquitous language. This is the plain language that you use to describe the business processes, entities, and relationships. And he asserts that what the business is really doing is developing a precise, ubiquitous language over time. Right? And when you, it turns out, though, that the ubiquitous language needs to be taken care of. Because if you're careless about it, then you start to talk about the solution in terms of the technology. You start to talk about the solution in terms of resources, or SQL statements, or tables. But those things are just implementation details. Because the GraphQL API uses a graph, when you say something like, fetch all of the films that Luke Skywalker appeared in, and for each film, fetch the characters and their names, that translates almost one-to-one -to, -one to the document. And you lose no specificity in the ubiquitous language. I'm not saying that you can just kind of go on autopilot and you'll get a perfect ubiquitous language by using GraphQL, but I am saying that I've, I don't think any other API technology allows you to build as, as concrete of a ubiquitous language as GraphQL. Uh, we get a lot of questions about versioning. Uh, this is kind of tongue in cheek. Um, actually, all of the versioning strategies that are available in REST are also available in GraphQL because you can just serve it over HTTP and therefore you can version the route, you can version the headers, you can version the MIME type. You can do all these things. And why I say don't here is because Facebook has had the most complex schema I've seen of any GraphQL endpoint. We had over 10,000 types. And we never versioned the GraphQL API. There's no notion of version in it. Which means that if, you've, if you have a really old first generation iPhone with the first version of Facebook installed on it, you can fire that up today. It'll issue GraphQL requests to the server. And chances are very good that that will still work. Now, I'm not saying that there were never any API breaking changes in that API in that schema. There were. But those were done very carefully. Those were done in a measured way. And we, before we ever made those changes, we understand exactly how many clients that would break. So when it comes to tooling and docu documentation, we already saw a really good example with the GraphQL IDE. It can perform an introspection query. And then it can show us the documentation right in line and help us write the, the query. But documentation and tooling goes a lot further than that. Oops. Uh, I cannot get this. OK, let me click it. OK, here's an example of uh, one of the VS Code extensions. And after you've performed the introspection query and downloaded it into your client, the extension can now track the kinds of GraphQL queries you're writing inside the editor and give you type hints, autocomplete compilation. It can tell you whether or not this abides by the rules in the GraphQL language specification. All the things you'd expect from an integrated, uh, integrated development environment. This is another question that comes up all the time. How do you perform authentication and authorization in GraphQL? Authentication refers to who you are, and authorization refers to whether you can do what you're trying to do. And the answer is that authentication and authorization are not GraphQL problems. Let me try to convince you of that. Let's say you have the following stack diagram, and you have your client sending requests to the server over a variety of different transports. Up at the top, they come down from the top. Think about what a typical HTTP server looks like. The HTTP server processes the request in a pipeline pattern. right? And the first thing that it can look at is the authentication headers. In the authentication header, you might have some sort of access token, a JWT, perhaps. 
what is the server going to do? It's going to crack open that JWT. It's going to check its signature, and it's going to check the expiration window. And if that's not a valid access token, it rejects the request right there. That request will never make it to the resource controllers inside your REST API. And that's the way it should be. Why should your resource controllers be looking at invalid requests, right? So we now know that authentication belongs as close to the end of the transport layer as possible. But what about authorization? And let's come up with an example of author an authorization rule. Let's say we're, we're building something like WordPress and we have an authorization rule that says only editors and authors can see content in the draft state, right? That makes sense. Okay, that's an authorization rule. Let's say we put that into the GraphQL layer. Only authors and admins can see content in the draft state. What's the problem with this? Yeah. Okay, it might not know who the author is, right? But hopefully we, we figured it out with the, with the format of the authentication token. Um, the problem here is that what if you make this call through REST or RPC? You're not hitting the same authorization logic anymore because you've embedded the authorization logic in GraphQL. Okay, well, we know how to fix that. We're software engineers. Let's just copy and paste the code everywhere. Let's just copy and paste authorization logic across all of our different API, uh, API layers. And that'll fix the problem, right? Oh, wait, I, I forgot. The RPC layer is implemented in C++. I can't copy and paste JavaScript code into C++. So let me translate it. But it turns out I'm not that good at C++. Now there's a bug. Even if everything were the same language, copying and pasting it introduces a problem of how I synchronize shipping all of these different modules. If all of these things are ma managed by, if they're considered microservices and managed by different teams, how do I coordinate the release train, right? Because the whole point of microservices is that each team can control their own release schedule. So I hope that this is a, a proof by contradiction almost that we don't want authorization logic in the GraphQL layer. We want it in the business logic layer because it is business logic. Authorization is business logic. And it turns out that most businesses, they end up building a lot of, I, I've seen a lot of authorization logic. I mean, take Facebook, for example. It's almost entirely authorization logic. This is business logic, right? Don't treat it as some special thing that needs to be split out somewhere. There should be a single source of truth for it. And so you update it once, and then it consistently applies to the API calls coming in from any source. All right. So you like what you see, you go back to the team, and you're like, we should use GraphQL. But when? When do we do it? When do we make the switch? And to answer this question, I stole this slide from Martin Fowler. And Martin Fowler had this great idea. He asked, what's the point of good design? Why do we care? Why do we spend effort on design patterns, documentation, organization? Why? So he thought about this, and this is what he came up with. He has this graph, and on the y-axis, you have cumulative functionality. So the higher you are up on the y-axis, the more functionality your application has. And then on the x-axis, you have time. And what he asserts is that if you invest no time in design, you're always adding features, feature after feature after feature, always writing code that just incrementally adds features. In the beginning, you will have a very high velocity because there are no features to get in the way. But as you go on, the weight of the code base will start to slow things down. You change something in one place, something else in some other place breaks. And that's modeled at the, as the slope of this curve here, right? In the beginning, the slope is higher, and then it tapers off. What that means is that in order to achieve the same amount of incremental functionality in the application, it takes more and more time. Or put it another way, given the same amount of time, you can achieve less and less. Consequently, when you do take the time to invest in good design, soft design patterns, organization, documentation, education, you are not adding features. And that's an opportunity cost. So there's a duration where if you invest in good design, you're not adding enough features. And you're actually lagging behind the no design approach in terms of cumulative functionality. You're making an investment. When will that investment pay off? at a certain level of complexity where the weight of the code base starts to matter.
and he calls this the design payoff line. Below the design payoff line, you should not invest in design. Above the design payoff line, you should invest in design. Now, anybody who just heard me say that is probably thinking, that is a gross oversimplification. Come on, right? And it is. I mean, anytime you have these kinds of like two axis, you know, these four magic quadrant whatever things, you know that there's a lot of hand waving going on. So I'm not trying to say apply this literally, but it is an interesting thought experiment. And I'll also add that Martin Fowler believes that the design payoff line is a lot lower than you think because the complexity of the application is a lot higher. And we software engineers tend to underestimate the complexity of solving any given problem. So you want to get GraphQL in production. Here are some do's and do nots. Do not try to boil the ocean. If your company has a complex set of problems that it solves, don't try to build the schema all at once. Build the tiniest part of the schema that could possibly work. Do not try to replace the REST API in one go. This is just a, another way of saying don't boil the ocean, right? Don't even try to replace the REST API at all. Someday when you no longer need it, you can remove it and it won't be an event. But starting off with the goal of replacing your REST API is not the recipe for success. Don't place business logic in the GraphQL there. We already talked about this with respect to authorization. Uh, but any business logic in the GraphQL layer poses the same problem. Now, when you're just beginning, you're playing around with it, you want to see what GraphQL is like, a couple of bits of business logic here and there, okay. But over time, this problem, this will get worse and worse. Do make sure that the entire team is on board. Don't try to sneak GraphQL into production. That's not going to work. Uh, find the solution that fits with your stack. If your backend engineers are experienced in administering Go applications, then don't use the reference implementation just because it's the reference implementation. Build a simple query first. This is related to building the simplest possible schema. The simplest possible query is something that returns a scalar field, like our greet operation, right? That's the simplest possible thing that can work. It has no authorization, it has no authentication, and it's a scalar field. But if you try to deploy that into production, you'll have to overcome a number of challenges, like what stack are you using? How do you route to the GraphQL server? What about SSL termination? What about caching? The, you'll solve a number of problems that makes you a lot more mature in terms of dealing with the schema in the future. And then now, adding to the schema does not come with all of that baggage anymore. And then you can gradually add in more advanced features like auth, mutations, subscriptions. And you can even consider some of the advanced use cases, like using GraphQL in front of a bunch of REST APIs for your microservices, and now you have one consistent API gateway for your front end to talk to, because the front end usually doesn't care about microservices. Um, you can also think about serving the GraphQL endpoint to your third-party callers, right? If you have other users who, if your, if your service is mainly an API, maybe you want to ship the schema to your clients and your users. GraphQL is also used for service-to-service -service communication. Again, this is not it was what it was designed for, but it's quite good at it. Uh, here are some ecosystem links that you may want to check out. AWS AppSync. This is our GraphQL as a service, serverless GraphQL as a service. You never have to manage a single GraphQL server. You write your schema first. So this is the schema-first approach as, to the, as opposed to the code-first approach we saw in the demo. And then you can hook up your resolvers to Lambda functions or DynamoDB or a number of other data sources on the AWS backend. And probably the coolest feature about AppSync is that when you spin up an AppSync endpoint, it also spins up a WebSocket, a real-time gateway fleet for you. So remember all the, the, the problems that I talked about when you're migrating state, when you're trying to scale a stateful tier? That's handled for you when you use AWS AppSync. And then as a result, you get subscriptions for free. I want to tell you a little bit more about the GraphQL Foundation. As I mentioned, its purpose is to protect the evolution of the GraphQL language. It is part of the Linux Foundation. And one of its main responsibilities is to fund development of common tools like Graphical and GraphQL Playground. Another purpose it serves is to provide transparent evolution of the GraphQL specification. So let's say that a couple years down the road, you have GraphQL in production, you like it, and you depend heavily on the GraphQL specification version, because let's say you have a third-party developer ecosystem, right? 
and they care about the version of GraphQL that you're on. They always want you to be on the head version because they think that's the best one. And if GraphQL were to somehow ship a version of the schema that broke all of the stuff that you had, you'd be very frustrated, rightly so. So you should have an opportunity to participate in that conversation, and you do. We have something called the GraphQL Working Group, and this is open to anybody. In fact, tomorrow is our next working group session. You can sign up on GitHub, dial in, and you will get a great sense of all of the cutting edge features that we're debating for inclusion into the GraphQL specification. Speaking of cutting edge features, let me give you a quick, uh, some, some quick spoilers here. We're working on input unions, interface inheritance, custom scalers, and the HTTP specification. These are all works in progress. None of these is guaranteed to be included in the spec anytime soon, but we're working on them. Custom scalers, for example, this is the ability to add more scalers. Remember, a scalar is what your, graph, your document must terminate in. But a lot of customers run into the limitations in terms of where's the daytime scaler? Where's the JSON scaler? Right? We get these requests so often that we are trying to find a scalable way to include any number of custom scalers. And finally, here are a number of resources. GraphQL.org, probably the best place to get started if you're brand new to GraphQL. Um, we have our GitHub repo. We have the demo here. This is the third link. If you want to run this demo yourself, you want to toss it up on a server, you want to show it to your, your team, you want to show it to your parents, go ahead. I don't, whatever. <laughs> uh, and then AppSync at the bottom, of course, uh, you know, definitely check it out, especially if you're running lots of workloads on AWS, especially if you're working with Lambdas. This is probably the fastest and e easiest way to get started with the GraphQL endpoint. Thank you very much. That's all I have. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.